see that the when the mind became invested in form, you know, metaphorically in that sense, it forgot about the mind. You know, it, 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 we we end up going to school and we learn about we learn about history and we learn about bodies and we, in a health class we learn about anatomy. <laughs> you know, and nowadays occasionally you find like a psychology class <laughs> occasionally filtering down into you know things, but it's like. The deceived mind has has forgotten that it has, that it is a mind. You know, in, in psychology, there's there was the old behaviorism trends. You know, you can't see it, you can't measure it, doesn't exist, kind of. Or uh, science, still, you know, much basis on empirical evidence in the world. I mean, it's it's taken it's taking a while to, to for the mind to start to first of all be convinced that it is a mind or has a mind, and then to figure out. In a sense, how does this mind work? And, and, it, and I mean that in a general sense. It, it doesn't really help to study the ego. A lot of psychology kind of goes around in circles when you end up studying the psychosis, or you know, a lot of the, the DSM-3 and lots of the things in psychology have got all these categories and labels for all these so-called sicknesses and everything. And, and literally, the ego, Jesus says, loves studying itself. So when I talk about studying the mind, I'm not talking about that, but it's like learning laws of mind, learning the laws of mind as God created it, and learning the, the twisted ones that the ego has. The, the most fundamental law of mind in the early text, Jesus said, is what you extend, you are. That's how the, the law is in heaven. God extended himself, and that's how the Son was born. The Son was an idea in the mind of God. It's this sense of, of creation, of expansion, of increase. And yet it doesn't have any time involved in it. You know, try to figure that one out. How, how can you have increase without the concept of quantity? But, but what the ego does in this world, that same law, what you extend you are, coming through the ego's filter is what you project you will believe. <clears throat> and so the world is projected, the body is projected, and, and in a sense it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now that the, the mind has held on to these attack thoughts, they have to be projected. I mean, there's no way you can hold on to attack thoughts in the mind because the ego says, it's like, here's the Holy Spirit and here's the ego, and it's just, oh, got to project them. And that's what the, the dynamic of projection is. That's why, you know, you get angry at, at people. It's, I don't want to look at, is, is it the decision I'm making? <laughs> you know, I don't want to look at anger as my decision. I want to be justified. In, in saying that this person obviously did this, don't you think? You know, then you go <laughs> quick. I, and I'm not sure, so I'm going to get six or seven people to agree with me, you know, that really it was this person's fault. They have a very disagreeable personality. You know, you've got a good reason to be. You know, and you see how insidious this ego works because it cries to get allies immediately. You notice the first thing that, that you always do is always the perceptual judgment, you know about the situation involving this person. I mean, if, when you really look at it, if, if the Course is telling us, and Jesus is telling us, is your spirit, your eternal, your changeless, your infinite, your magnitude, you are powerful. I mean, you know, this, this contradicts the experience in the world of being a weak, little, frail person battling against big economic, political forces, their diseases, their, you know, these are two different ways, obviously, and, and one of them has to be right. Jesus is saying, one of them is true, it's the magnitude. But, but ultimately it comes down to this sense of um, personhood. That what I've noticed is that the self-concept involves, I'm an important person, and you're another, you're an other, you're a real different person than I am. It's, it's what Krishnamurti and a lot of the mystics have called the subject-object split, you see, is, which of course is two right away. Instead of just complete unity and oneness, the, the ego, with the optical illusion of the world, breaks it up into a subject-object split. And who is the subject? That's me, the person, okay, the personality. And who is the object? That is any other person or the world. You can be the object. No. Thanks. I wanted to be. <laughs> so, so we've got subject David and object Gene. Gene. <laughs> and and the subject has his own. History. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and here we go, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, 
And not only that, but we've got different self-concepts and we've got um, different beliefs. So the more time that we spend together in this metaphorical sense of, of communicating, talking, and everything, then all of a sudden you believe, you believe what? You know, I mean, look at look at marriages. I mean, you know, you get married, and then things like, um, you know, do you open the packages on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? You know, big issues start to surface. <laughs> My mom always taught me this was the way, and you're saying what? You know, it's like I'm drawing the line here. You know, it's like. And and then you get into this thing of compromise, you know. I mean, I always thought compromise was good. I grew up, you know, compromise is a good thing. And the Course is saying that, that forget compromise, that there is a way of looking at the world, of tuning into the Holy Spirit, where everyone gains. There's, in compromise, it's like, I'll give a little, you give a little, we'll mediate, we'll work this issue out and form, you know. We'll, We'll open them on Christmas Eve this year, but next year, you know, I'll make a bargain with you. But, but what the Course is saying is there is a way of training our minds and of literally looking at the world where, forget compromise, that each decision that we make will be one in which the entire Sonship will benefit. This is an extraordinary idea, because if we believe that we're this little person, we're always gauging our decisions, you know, well, if I do this, what will my boss think, or what will my husband or wife think, or it's like we end up, you know, the old thing about making lists and putting the pros on one side and the cons on the other. The Course is giving us a radical new way, saying that every decision you make is for the whole sonship. You know, that you're literally choosing between the ego and the Holy Spirit every instant. But you don't see it that way. You've got, here's the ego and the Holy Spirit in the mind. This is the intolerable situation. The mind can't stand that, because, you know, intolerable so it starts stacking on beliefs on top of that beliefs in the world to cover over that this is what's going on in the mind and and basically here comes the miracle impulse from the Holy Spirit very powerful shooting up through the mind but it's got to come through all you know like those cookies we had in there you know it's got to come through all these crooks and crannies and everything and boom it comes out on the surface and it's like on the surface is I'm a person and I'm deciding to buy a car. I've just decided to buy a Chrysler. So here we got our miracle impulse has <laughs> come through all these layers and levels of form and now I'm a person buying a car. Now, do I want the red Chrysler or the green Chrysler? Ooh, gosh, it's a tough decision. I kind of debate on this one. What color should it be? I'm now here Jesus is kind of saying, you know, you're choosing between two illusions. You're straining. <laughs> oh, you want the green car or you want the the red car, you know? And what he's basically saying is that as long as you perceive yourself as a person in the world, you're, you perceive that your choice is in the world, that I'm a person in the world and I've got to choose between circumstances. I've got to choose where to live, where, where to work, you know, who I'm going to live with, you know, gosh, what time it is, do I got to go, you know, on and on, make choices. And, and all Jesus is saying is that the real choice is simply between the ego and the Holy Spirit. And it's right down here. It's way down here in your mind. You've got to question all these <laughs> silly beliefs that you've got blocking the real choice. Jesus says, bring the problem back to the solution. Bring the problem from perceiving to be a problem between the red car and the green car <laughs> that you're debating over to it's between the ego and the Holy Spirit. So he helps us go through and peel the layers of the onion, if you will, to go deeper and deeper down to see that, gee, this is the only decision. Once you peel all the layers, once you go all the way down to the bottom, and you see that the problem wasn't out there in the world, the problem wasn't between the cars, the problem wasn't my boyfriend or my girlfriend, or it wasn't I lost my job, the problem was, here it is, it's all unveiled, all this, I've gone beyond all these beliefs, and here's what I'm looking upon now, here's the ego, and here's the Holy Spirit. This is no choice. <laughs> this is no choice at all. Bing! Wake up, <laughs> you know. But you see why the, the going down through the beliefs is so important. You know, you got to get down to the to the Holy Spirit and to the ego. That's why rules for decision, you know, it's kind of like, how do you feel, you know? Just think of yourself when you wake up in the morning, I want to have a happy day. I want, I want happiness and peace more than anything else. And if you hold on to that idea, you know, you really hold on to that. You just tenaciously hold on to, I want peace of God more than anything else, 
That's the day that will be given you. You will have a perfectly happy, peaceful day. But when alternatives start to enter your mind, you know, it's like, well, I'm having a peaceful day, but I, I've got to be at this important business meeting, and this train's in front of me, and I'm going to lose my job. So it's kind of a, here we go again, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm back into the beliefs again. And that's, it just doesn't cut the mustard, you know. It's like, well, the peace of God stuff was good for a while, but this is, Big, this is the real stuff. This is the train. I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. You know, kind of, I'm orchestra. I'm, I'm reading meaning into this. The train is going to hold me up. I'm going to be late. I'm going to lose my job. Ah, there goes all the, the fear thoughts. So, I mean, what a tool that we have to help cut through all these, these beliefs or help dissolve all these beliefs. Time is is down there at the bottom too. I mean. You know, sometimes it's frustrating for people when they read in the course that that all it takes is one instant. You know, you gotta be kidding me! One instant, you know, I, I could really in just one instant choose to accept my perfection. You know, as God created me, it's like, yeah. But when you believe in time, you know, time and space and matter and and the world and everything the world's built on, that's where it seems to take time. To work things out, and it really wouldn't be, it would be a very short little book, if it just, if you opened up this big book and it just had two words in it, God is, you know, <laughs> like oh, what I mean, that's that's pretty much a fact, but I need help where I believe I am. So Jesus wrote the Course in Miracles with all these lay layers and, and different levels, so that wh wherever you believe you are, you can kind of grab onto something as like a stepping stone. Then you say, yeah, this idea resonates with me. I'll put my foot on that and I'll anchor on that for a while. And then you you stay there for a while and it's kind of nice, but you start to feel like, oh, there's something more. And then something else jumps out at you. You've read the same paragraph maybe for two years. And then all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. Another one. You, know? <laughs> you get to step on another step. And then the other one, yeah, I don't need that one below now. It's fine. You know, others may seem to need it, but, but I don't need it. And it's like a ladder, you know, that he's kind of given us in the Course in Miracles a ladder to kind of, how do we get out of here? We climb. <laughs> One rung at a time. You know? <laughs> metaphysically, if it never happens, metaphysically it's just a bad dream, that's not where my experience is. You know, I've got, <laughs> give me a rung down here that I can stand on, you know, so we do that. And, and they just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And ultimately, the higher rungs are the subject-object split. That, that as soon as I start to give up my investments in personhood, you know, what are my investments in personhood? If I believe I'm a man, and I go into the discussion and a, a group of women start saying, oh, men, men this, men that, you know, here they come, the defense is like, you know, you're talking about me, because you see the me is, is identified as being it's a man. It's not you, it's just your testosterone. <laughs> it's just the testosterone, or the hormones, or whatever, you know. When you start to look at this self-concept stuff, it's this construct that we've made up, and whatever it is that we're valuing, whatever it is we'll defend, I'm an American, you know, forget Saddam and da-da-da, we're still into that subject-object split. We're still identifying with an illusion of ourselves. It's always tied into form. And the Course is nothing different than just starting to say, I mean, it was great when I could watch a Reds game finally, you know, and sit down and try to watch the divine perfection when the Reds were playing the Dodgers. Or, or at Wimbledon, I was, I, I was really into tennis, you know. I, years ago I would watch Wimbledon and I would root so hard for Jimmy Connors that I would sweat for like five hours against Bjorn Borg. I would, I would probably lose more liquid than Jimmy Connors lost because I was pulling for him so hard on each point. <laughs> oh, it hit the tape. It fell back on his side, you know. It's, it's, it's the same old thing, you know. It, it was like a real investment. My identity was tied up in how Jimmy Connors' career went, you know, or Pete Rose or, or so forth. And you can start to see how your emotions hinge on the external outcome. You know? <laughs> Connors pulls it out in the fifth set. Yes, I'm going to be happy for a week. <laughs> But then, <laughs> the next match, <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's like, it's on and on and on. It's like from insanity to sanity, you yeah. know, it's like that. Just that 
second, that one instant, I guess even in making a decision between the Holy Spirit and the ego, it all is right in that second. Mm -hmm. and